Hello everyone. My name is Emma and this is Learn From The Past, a channel where I geek out about cool history stuff and you hopefully learn some cool history stuff. Let's get started. Today, we're finishing up the Nellie Bly series with her final years from the end of her trip around the world to her death in 1922. So first off, I know it's been a while since I've posted. As I mentioned in my last video, my schedule is a little hectic right now and I won't be able to maintain bi-weekly uploads, though I will always upload on a Friday at 9am Central Standard Time. So thank you for your patience. There are also some words and phrases and places in Hungarian in this video. I've done my best to pronounce them correctly, but please be aware that I'm not an expert, and I apologize if any of my pronunciations are incorrect. So far in our Nellie Bly saga, she has exposed abuses at Blackwell's Lunatic Asylum and Bellevue Hospital. She has lived in Mexico for half a year observing the culture, and she has beaten her fictional inspiration and traveled the world in less than 80 days. After her return to the New York world in the winter of 1890 following her record-breaking global circumnavigation, Bly expected a raise. When she didn't get one, she quit. She bounced around to different papers for a while but was mostly assigned fluff pieces, very humdrum after her life of stunt reporting. Bly found steady work at the Times Herald for a while but was unceremoniously fired when the editor died. After her exit from reporting, the country waited to hear from Bly, constantly searching for her byline. But the next time Nellie Bly's name appeared in the newspaper, it wasn't as a byline under an article, but rather as part of a wedding announcement. In 1895, Bly married a rich man in his late 70s, Robert Seaman probably a reflection of her lack of spending money. Seaman owned a steel barrel company, the Ironclad Steel Barrel Co., which he gave in its entirety to Bly when he died just nine years later. For the rest of her life, Bly would be tied up in legal battles with Seaman's adult children who felt that Bly had stolen their inheritance. Bly also pressed charges against her business partner, whom she felt had mishandled Ironclad's finances. When a judge ruled that it was Bly who had mismanaged her company and owed money to the government, she fled to Europe? She transferred legal control of the Ironclad Steel Barrel Company to her mother. After asking her mother to sign an agreement stating that the company would be returned to Bly upon Bly's request, Nellie Bly left immediately for Europe with a note saying that she'd only be gone for three weeks. Once overseas, Bly headed straight for Austria-Hungary. The year was 1914, and Bly was stuck behind enemy lines when war broke out in Europe. By 1914, it had been more than 20 years since Bly had last written for a newspaper, and the game had changed in her absence. Bly's tendency to write in first person and inject her own experiences into her stories had fallen out of favor in journalism as a profession, but she saw no reason to change a formula that had worked for her for most of her life. Bly, already on the ground, was one of the first American correspondents to cover the Great War. She needed to make contacts in the government in order to be allowed to operate as a foreign correspondent. Luckily, the Hotel Imperial, where Bly was staying in Vienna, was a revolving door of the most powerful people in Austria-Hungary. During her stay, Bly met with the Austrian Foreign Minister, Count Leopold Berchtold, and his wife, Countess Nadine Berchtold, and Princess Alexandrine von Windischgratz. With letters of support thus acquired, she petitioned the Austro-Hungarian government and was awarded a spot as a foreign correspondent with the Kriegspreschquartier, or KPQ, the press agency specifically designed to cover the war. But before she could work for the government in their propaganda office, she needed to be affiliated with a newspaper. Having retired from the New York world, Bly applied to and was hired at the New York Evening Journal. 
In her capacity as a KPQ reporter, Bly became the first woman reporter to visit the front lines with an organized trip of foreign correspondence in October of 1914. The KPQ tour headed straight for Chemizo, by that time the only border town still in Austrian hands, and one of the only towns in the province of Galicia still in Austrian hands. On her way to the front, Bly cabled the evening journal to let them know where she was going. The journal was thrilled. This trip would be the first American reporting from the front, the first American combat reporting by a woman, and all from the renowned Nellie Bly, no less. Bly, along with William Shepard, was one of only two American reporters reporting from the front before 1915. As excited as she was to see action, Bly was appalled by the conditions she saw. She noted the lack of horses and the way the animals that were available were overworked and abused. Bly wrote of the unsanitary conditions in the camps, of the soldiers in quarantine tents marked cholera, set aside and abandoned to die. Bly describes the qu quarantine tents, quote, human creatures they were, lying there in a manner our health authorities would prohibit for hogs, end quote. Bly ended her first wartime editorial, quote, In times like this, one does not lose one's pity, but one realizes one's helplessness. Perhaps that is the most terrible part of war, end quote. Arthur Brisbane, her editor, like Bly, made sure the New York Evening Journal had a decidedly pro-Austrian stance in their editorials. Which was all well and good, until the U.S. declared war on Austria and Germany in 1917. The paper's circulation plummeted. Bly, still in Austria and reporting on her immediate experiences, didn't find out about any of this until after the war. Three months into World War I, Bly's Chemitzil report and other reports from American reporters were the first such graphic depictions of wartime violence to appear in American newspapers. Along with Robert Dunn, George Schreiner, and William Shepard, Bly gave American readers their first real glimpse into the horrors of the Great War. From Chemnitzil, Bly and the other reporters went by train to Budapest, the Hungarian capital. Bly saw trains going toward Chemnitzil, carrying soldiers toward the front, and she saw soldiers going back toward Budapest on her own train. She contrasted the two groups, describing soldiers returning from the front, quote, their lips have forgotten how to smile, their bodies bear wounds, they are sore and bear the pains of long days and endless nights in wet, cold, muddy trenches. Besides their frightful wounds, they have cholera, dysentery, typhoid, and the hollow coughs which racked them like the last cough of a consumptive." End quote. Back in Budapest, Bly visited a field hospital at the urging of a doctor who wanted her to see, quote, the worst case I have ever seen in my entire life, end quote. The patient was a Russian soldier. He had been shot and lain in a trench for eight days before being brought into the hospital. Both of his feet had frozen and fallen off in transport. He had bled out profusely and was by then beyond saving. The soldier asked something in Russian that Bly couldn't understand. A nurse explained that the man was asking for his children. Unable to keep from crying, Bly left the tent. Moments later, the soldier died. On one of her last expeditions with the KPQ, Bly and the other reporters traveled to Serbia, where an Austrian advance had recently succeeded. On the boat trip down the Danube, Bly became mysteriously ill, with a fever, shooting pains in her legs, and inflamed spots from her knees down. Bly traveled into Serbia, reporting mostly on the soldiers returning from the front as she was too ill to visit the front herself. She finished her Serbia reporting with a trip to a field hospital, which she described the grievous wounds of the soldiers. From Serbia, Bly traveled back to the relative safety of Vienna. 
Back in Vienna, Bly and fellow American reporter William Shepard were both criticized by the Austrian ambassador Konstantin Dumba for their reporting. Dumba criticized Shepard for characterizing the Austrian retreat from Serbia as a rout, and he criticized Bly for describing the unsanitary conditions in Galicia. Although Bly remained in Austria for the remainder of the war, her KPQ credentials were revoked, and Dumba's criticism ended her only stint of war reporting. It was only 1915, and the war would continue for three more years. Before going overseas, Bly had signed over her company to her mother, Mary Jane Cochran, with the understanding that her mother would give her company back to Bly when the time came. But while Bly was busy covering the war overseas, the Ironclad Steel Barrel Company under Mary Jane Cochran filed for bankruptcy after it came out that Bly had not paid her creditors in years. After she lost the company, Mary Jane also lost her house and moved in with Bly's younger brother Albert and his wife. When Bly found out about this in a letter in late 1918, she tried to hurry home. But her return visa was delayed because of pro-Austrian rhetoric in her wartime editorials. When she returned to the U.S., Bly tried to get in touch with President Woodrow Wilson to urge him to send aid to Austria. Her letters caught the attention of the administration, and Bly was arrested and questioned by Wilson's chief of staff, who concluded that her sentiments were based on misinformation disseminated in Austria during the war and no real malice toward the United States. Bly was released and given back her press credentials. Bly had put her company in her mother's name when she left. After having her mother sign an agreement that she would give the company back to Bly upon Bly's request. When Bly returned to the States, however, her mother claimed to have no recollection of the agreement and the safety deposit box she had kept the hard copy in had been emptied out and its contents destroyed. Bly and her brother Harry both filed lawsuits against their half-brother Albert for selling off their belongings without their permission. When Albert was arrested, he charged Bly with malicious mischief. Although her own mother testified against her, the charges against Bly were dropped the day after they were first brought to court. Likewise, the charges against Albert were also dropped, though his trial took longer. Although Bly won her trial, she fell out with her mother and her half-brother, who still owned the house. Bly, now homeless, turned to Arthur Brisbane at the New York Journal for help. He offered her a salary lower than her starting salary 20 years earlier. Bly, in dire straits, took his offer. Nellie Bly's return to the New York Journal received a four-column, all-caps headline on the front page, but her signature first-person contemplative writing style was much slower than the breakneck speed favored in journalism by that time. She started up an advice column where she advised young women from all over the city on matters of love, duty, work, and motherhood. What had begun almost accidentally with a single open letter quickly became Bly's full-time job. When Bly's column started attempting to find homes for orphaned children, she turned her editorial skills to fixing the orphanage system. Her writing began to focus heavily on social justice issues. In 1920, Bly became the first woman in 21 years to witness a public execution. Her follow-up article was a strong indictment of capital punishment. She became a moral crusader in her final years, writing against capital punishment, gambling, men dating significantly younger women, and championing jobs for disabled people, especially the blind. She wrote in favor of leniency for first-time offenders and in favor of post-prison rehabilitation and re-entrance into society. Bly, then in her mid-fifties, began to neglect her health in favor of her editorial and charitable pursuits. She raced around the city in all kinds of weather, skipped meals to keep working, and was very picky about the food she did eat. In 1920, she fell ill and spent a significant amount of time in the hospital. On February 26, 1920, Bly's mother died at her home in Brooklyn of bladder cancer at age 94. 
Her brother Albert took control of his mother's estate. When Albert started auctioning off their mother's furniture, Bly had him arrested, since most of the furniture was Bly's and had been lent to their mother during the Great War. Ultimately, though, charges didn't pan out and Albert was released. In late 1920, Bly, in her charitable pursuits helping single mothers, was introduced to eight-year-old Dorothy Coulter. Dorothy's mother had abandoned her at a hospital, where she suffered from a respiratory illness. Bly tried to track down Dorothy's mother, Grace Coulter. She was found in a few weeks, thanks to a newspaper campaign initiated by Bly. Unfortunately, Grace had tuberculosis. Bly had her moved to the best hospital in New York City, but it was too late. Grace Coulter was beyond help. She died, and in late 1921, Bly received court permission to adopt Dorothy Coulter as her daughter. Dorothy Coulter became Dorothy Coulter Cochran, after Bly's real name, Elizabeth Cochran Seaman. On January 9, 1922, Bly entered the hospital for bronchopneumonia. She signed her will two days later on January 11th. Bly bequeathed her sugar company to her previous partner, Oscar Bondi. She gave her German Shepherd to her attorney, Hill, and all her money to her niece and her niece's husband. She left her steel barrel company to her niece as well, even though the lawsuit over ownership was still ongoing. The lawsuit, though, ended suddenly when the company was driven into bankruptcy less than a year after Bly's death. Bly's adoptive daughter, Dorothy, stayed with Bly's niece and her husband for a while before settling permanently with the husband's sister. Dorothy Coulter Cochran became Dorothy Coulter Cochran Watson. Nellie Bly died on January 27, 1922, at 8.35 a.m. She was 58 years old. Her funeral was held two days later. Upon her death, the New York World, the paper where she made her name, ran a 10-page obituary recounting her extraordinary career. So that concludes the Nellie Bly saga. I hope you've enjoyed learning about her as much as I have. I went into this project not knowing much about Bly, other than that she feigned insanity to expose abuses in an asylum. <laughs> I've really enjoyed learning about her, and I hope you've all enjoyed taking that journey with me. As always, my sources will be cited in Chicago Manual style at the end of the video. If you're interested in learning more about Nellie Bly, or if you just want to fact check me. <laughs> if you really are interested in learning more about Nellie Bly, I recommend this this biography by Brooke Kroger. I used it as the jumping off point for my research on all four of the Nellie Bly videos. It's certainly not perfect, and I've done a whole video about the issues with biographies as historical sources, see above, but overall it's a good starting point if you're interested in Nellie Bly and her never boring life. Thank you so much for watching, and remember, those who don't learn from the past are doomed to repeat it. So don't doom yourself. I'll see you next time.